Hello, everybody, and welcome to HardAssetsInvestor.com. I'm Mike Norman, your host. Well, the FX markets have always had an influence on commodities, and here to talk about the FX outlook, who better than Mark Chandler, Chief Currency Strategist at Brown Brothers Harriman. Mark, thanks for coming back on the show. I haven't seen you in a while, but I see you out there all the time on uh, other various programs. Let's talk now about uh, foreign exchange markets. Obviously, lots going on, especially uh, with Europe. I saw a statistic the other day that something like 40 billion in bets against the euro. In other words, people making bets that the euro would fail. Is this a failed bet? I mean, with everything that's gone on, the euro has been pretty resilient, wouldn't you say? Yeah, the euro is pretty resilient. It's still above its fair value, like purchasing power parity. Uh, I think that the, at the IMM, the Commitment of Traders in the Futures Market, shows the highest number of net short positions since the middle of last year. Well, that's a contrarian indicator in my book, anyway. Yeah, but I, I think that the, uh, people can win on that bet, though, is if the euro falls or if it breaks up. And I think that they might win on the euro falling further. I think the euro, uh, today it's trading around 134. I think that by the end of the year, we're down below 130. Really? Uh, but I think that uh, the euro zone doesn't break up. I think this is where I think that the uh, uh, people are nervous, and they rightly so. But I, I would compare it to uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. You've got the, uh, the Soviet ships coming into the U.S. blockade, and which side blinks first? And I think that if you blink right now, you miss the real play. Yeah, I agree with you. I do not think uh, the Eurozone will break up. And I think we're closer to a resolution, at least in terms of the, the solvency issue, which has been really the crisis thus far. Um, and I think it's a realization that the ECB has to be sort of the quasi-fiscal authority of Europe. There's been resistance to that on the part of Germany. But now I think Germany seems to be acquiescing as long as conditions are put in place. If the ECB is going to do this, um, you know, they're going to have to uh, enforce more austerity, this sort of thing. Do, is that how you see it playing out? Yeah, I think that what happens is that uh, Germany needs to uh, share its balance sheet with the other countries. But it can't just do so blindly. So it's going to have these, <coughs> excuse me, these uh, conditions. I think the conditions have to be threefold. There has to be something that gives Europe a veto over countries' budgets. So they can't just spend willy-nilly like the Greeks did. Secondly, there has to be some element, some mechanism for surveillance right. of implementation because there's always implementation risk. Uh, Greece says they're going to do X, but even this year they have a bigger budget deficit than last year. So you need the surveillance to make sure they're implementing properly. And you also need the stick. You need something that penalizes, some kind of automaticity that penalizes countries for violating the agreement. And this is important because back in the early 90s, the first countries to violate, excuse me, earlier in the uh, two, two, 2000 period, the first countries to violate the, mass, the uh, st Growth and Stability Pact, or the Stability and Growth Pact, was Germany and France. And they weaseled their way out of being fined. And so you need some kind of automatic principles in place so that it doesn't have to be this political maneuvering. Now, you hit on something uh, that I think we need to discuss, which is the fact that despite uh, austerity measures up until now, Budget deficits have been increasing, which is exactly the way it unfolds. The austerity mm -hmm. reduces economic output. There's a certain level mm -hmm. of uh, government spending that will always be there in the form of automatic stabilizers, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it actually results in the opposite of what they're trying to achieve. Don't we get mm -hmm. into a situation down the road where the austerity just causes the deficits to mushroom and then you're faced with a problem of either having to accept those deficits or what? What, what is the, uh, you know, what right. are you faced with at that point? Yeah, I think you're right that it seems to me very true that the, the big challenge is how to sustain aggregate demand. And the way that the U.S. did it, the way that Europe did it until the crisis was through credit. And that, that avenue of sustain, that's sustaining, gone. that's gone. And so what can they do? I think that... If Greece is the poster child of countries that spent willy-nilly and didn't have any discipline for fiscal policy, I'd say Ireland is the best case of a country that imposed that austerity and is showing results. Even though I'd say Ireland is unique because one Anglo-American economy, flexible labor markets, and one of the few countries in the Eurozone to run a current account surplus. Ireland also is very interesting for U.S. investors because roughly uh, a fifth of everything Ireland produces comes from foreign companies based in Ireland, including U.S. companies like Intel and Pfizer of the world. Right. So, um, but, but still, it has come at a very high cost 
uh, to the Irish economy. Yes. Um, so you see the, the Eurozone not breaking up. You see the Euro uh, surviving as a currency. Um, what happens dollar euro exchange rate? Yeah, so I think that uh, the driving force, I think, is the European debt crisis. And it, why is the euro so resilient? I think it's partly because how Europe takes care of this problem is they've got to sell off their foreign assets. It's sort of like what happens after World War II. Uh, Germany, excuse me, uh, uh, the UK and France had these territorial empires. The U.S. insisted that they give them up, and they were reluctant to do so. It doesn't really end until maybe the Suez Crisis, but also think about uh, France pulling out of Indochina, U.S. getting involved. Uh, so I think what's happening now is parallel to that bringing in the territorial empire. Now they've got to bring in the commercial empires. And that means that banks have to sell off foreign assets, bring the money home to strengthen their balance sheets. And this is what's making the euro more resilient now. But I think that in the coming weeks, we're going to see the ECB take big action. Perhaps not exactly what you're looking for, but I can see next week the ECB taking three big steps at the, at the last meeting of the year. One is an interest rate cut. Uh, Draghi already gave us 25 basis points this month. I think that 25 is a done deal for next month and possibly even 50 basis points next month. In addition to that, they have to liberalize again the collateral rules. Right. They have to take anything that the banks have as collateral. As sort of, it, it doesn't sound very good financially, but this is what uh, the ECB needs to do to provide liquidity to the banks. Third thing it's going to do is it already given us a 12-month and a 13-month repo. This 13-month repo is going to go off uh, in December, and that's going to cover two year-end periods. What they're likely to do is give us a longer-term repo, two or three years, which is almost like a bond. You know what's very interesting is that um, while the Fed was mm -hmm. conducting uh, QE, quantitative easing, uh, the the dollar bears were everywhere. They were saying the Fed is the Fed is printing money, it's expanding its balance sheet, it's negative mm -hmm. for the dollar. They're debasing the currency. Meanwhile, we've seen the ECB's balance sheet grow to a point larger in dollar terms than the Fed's balance sheet. The ECB now is the largest central bank in the world. It has over three, I think about 3.2 mm -hmm. trillion in total assets compared to the Fed's maybe 2.8 trillion. Where's all the Euro bears? Mm -hmm. I know the Euro bears are mm -hmm. out there based on a breakup scenario, but you don't hear the same talk. Is there mm -hmm. an inherent dollar bias in the foreign exchange market where people just want to be bearish on the dollar no matter what because every time the fed does something they're all over the dollar but here's the ecb building up you know its balance sheet to something larger than what the fed has right. nobody's saying oh where's the debasement of the euro yeah i, th I think there, i think there's an element there i think part it's also the, the role of the u.s in the world economy and the role of the Federal Reserve in the world economy. Because it's different, I think that uh, people have this uh, uh, sort of an angst towards the U.S. and the role is so under greater scrutiny. But I do think that the European balance sheet, this is going to come back and haunt them. And just like the way uh, that some of the issues came back and haunted the U.S., I think we'll see more of that. And I think people, they see such low interest rates in the U.S. And it scares them because typically a current account deficit country needs to have higher interest rates to, to attract those inflows. But right now those inflows are coming in primarily at a safe haven. Now, a lot of people um, talk about just a global race to debase. In other words, uh, with economic conditions so difficult, uh, there's competition for exports around the world to push mm -hmm. exports as the driver for growth. And we see sort of policy initiatives or geared towards debasement of the currency. Um, is that true? Uh, do you think that's, you know, sort of behind mm -hmm. the scenes what policymakers are driving for, and is this like a competitive uh, devaluation that's going on? Yeah, I think that's, all, that's you know, sort of uh, interesting because that, 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 that uh, hypothesis explains many different facts. But I think that's what a good lie is, too. A good lie explains <laughs> the facts. And so I would offer a different interpretation of what's going on. I think that the dollar policy in the U.S. is really residual. The U.S. government, that is the Federal Reserve and the Treasury, will pursue policies that they think the domestic economy needs. Where the dollar goes, that's where it goes. They're not going to target the dollar at the fo foreign exchange prices. They're going to target domestic consi considerations. I think that the... Uh and so I, I don't really think that there's this race to debase. I think, look at what happened in the U.K. The U.K. announces uh, extending their own quantitative easing, increasing the size of the central bank's balance sheet. And what has the British pound done? Rallied about 6%. Right. Uh, the, Jap the Japanese are continuing to pursue quantitative easing. And, and the yen is strong. And the yen is strong. The so Swiss, the same story. They've been doing a quantitative easing through the uh, interest rate, uh, through the uh, currency cap uh, through... Uh, but they've managed to bring the Swiss franc down. They, they've been successful on this bout, but uh, 
they've also expanded the, the central bank's balance sheet, and the currency has gotten stronger. So I just think that there's a uh, the linkage between QE, or what we call QE, expanding a central bank's balance sheet, and the currency markets are not one-for-one -one correspondence. And so just like what happened uh, last year, a year ago this month, the Federal Reserve announced a Q, uh, what we call QE2. And the dollar rallied for the next six weeks, and it took everybody by surprise, mm -hmm. most people by surprise. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the same thing could happen. I mean, that the uh, you tell me central banks are going to pursue QE. Don't I'd say be careful about selling the currency. Look at the broader context. Now, no discussion of uh, foreign exchange markets would be complete without talking about China and the Chinese currency. Mm -hmm. um, people uh, saying that that is we're getting closer to the point where maybe that would replace the dollar. Not closer, but talk of that. We we mm -hmm. never used to hear talk of that. Right. How, how, you know, uh, uh, realistic is that uh, belief? Well, I'd say this, that I plan on living a long time, and I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. That is to say that China, in order for China to have a, an international currency, they've got to take measures that they're going to be loath to take. That is to liberalize the system. They need to change the banking system. They need to have a capital account. Money needs to be able to go in and out of the country freely. Now, it is true that some countries like, uh, like Chile, like Nigeria, have said they'll be willing to buy some Chinese bonds and put in reserves. But these are very yes, minor small, amounts. Yeah. Very, to, to, make, to let China really rival the dollar, let, rival the dollar, hasn't even rivaled the Hong Kong dollar, let alone the U.S. dollar. So I'd say that the dollar's role in the world economy seems very secure for the, for the coming years. China may, um, I think wherever capitalism grows the fastest, there's where you have crisis. And China has enough money and enough political will to overcome its current uh, uh, financial tensions, problem with the real estate market, problem with the banks. But I think at some point down the road, and I think that the uh, Boston Consulting Group had a very interesting study a couple months ago. They basically said that sometime around the middle of this decade, China's workforce is going to stop growing. Even though we think China has this unlimited number of people, right. their workforce is going to stop growing, consequence of the one-child policy. In addition to that, there's upward pressure on Chinese wages. The Boston Consulting Group estimates that somewhere by, uh, Chinese wages will be 20% of U.S. wages, and it, given the productivity difference, jobs can come back here. Right, so we're, we're gaining in competitiveness. China's maybe seeing a decline in that. Yeah, I think that's going to be the story for the second part of this decade. All right, so very quickly, outlook for the U.S. dollar for the next year. So for the next year, we look for, at least for the next six months, we look for the dollar to be stronger, ECB to cut rates more aggressively, Fed's balance sheet stays the same size, everybody else is expanding. So we look for the dollar to continue to strengthen. Maybe the euro goes back down to its birth rate. Which 117 is, around. 117, yep, yep. that would be good. And uh, I think that that puts sterling down closer to 140. All right, great, good stuff. Mark Chandler, thanks very much. That's it for now, folks. See you here next time. This is Mike Norman signing off. Bye-bye.